Victoria Louise. Yes. So. Why do I want to say remember, remember the 5th of November? I have no idea why. Anyway. Victoria Louise class cruiser. So. We've got on some of the Imperial German Navy's cruisers. And these are protected cruisers of the type that would probably lead to the German light cruisers, I would argue. This class provides key parts of the German fleet. Uh, the America Station. Yep, they maintained an America Station. <laughs> Gotta love them. Uh, the East Asia Squadron and the Home Fleet. When the Boxer Uprising took place, these ships went. When the Venezuelan crisis of 1902 and 1903 went, uh, took, pl took place, they went. They were modernized between 1905 and 1911 to become training ships for naval cadets. They mobilized the 5th Scouting Group at the outbreak of World War I. Why would you have a 5th Scouting Group? Because let's be honest, if your 1st, 2nd, 3rd and 4th Scouting Groups have all been taken out... This group, as your fifth scouting group, made up of ships which were built between 1895, when they were laid down, and commissioned before, uh, by in 1899, is probably not going to be the best group to go for. I'm, I, I might be wrong on this. You can, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but also with a top speed of 19 and a half knots. The fact is. They could possibly be overtaken by a dreadnought. I'm just, I'm just saying that HMS dreadnought could have shut them down and overtaken them. And if you're a small cruiser, that can actually be overtaken by dreadnought. The odds are she might actually do that just to ram you because we all know she likes to ram things more than she likes to shoot them with her guns. She'll do that if she has to, but if she can ram you, that's her first choice. If you're a submarine, small ship, anything that gets in her way, ram. Dreadnought really did take after the guy who took his motto from her, didn't he? You know, it's kind of very Jackie Fisher-ish. I can use my very powerful long-range guns to shoot you at range. However, I can also get very close to you and punch you hard. I will choose to do the latter because the former is just no fun. I don't know. So... The German Navy in the 1890s was in serious trouble. They liked large, uh, they liked cruisers which could do pretty good, ro a, a, a mixture of roles. They started to build at a certain point armoured cruisers, etc., and build up, but they really did like the intermediate level cruiser. These were core vessels for them. They'd become the forerunner of their light cruisers. They'd, in terms of their roles and outlines, but they were really the foundation of the German Navy as it became. And please note, I'm using German Navy because, of course, at this point, they are... Well... I think during the lives of these ships that German Navy changes names a few times. So we'll just leave it at German Navy because that's just easier than me remembering at which point we're in and which, na which name in German I should be pronouncing because I will just at a certain point get them confused. This is the Victoria Louise. Two 8.3 inch guns, fore and aft. Eight 5.9 inch guns, so that's two 21 centimeter guns. Eight 15 centimeter guns. Ten 8.8 .8 centimeter guns. It's the 88 millimeter. The Germans love that caliber. They love an 88 millimeter. I basically. Here is my opinion. If Germany's ever really preparing for war, you'll always know about it because they'll start produce, producing weapons in two calibers, 88 millimeters and 11 inches. If they ain't got an 88 millimeter in service and they ain't got an 11 inch gun under construction somewhere, they just aren't getting ready for war. 
Okay? So, I'm sorry. There are all these commentators out there who will tell you different. They'll look at the stats of their funding, etc. No, no, no. Look at the history. Germany, when they start thinking about war, it's always an 88mm and an 11 inch. They will turn up somewhere. They might not be their largest weapons, but they will be there. And they will be some of their most common. And they will just be there. Now, there is an argument with these ships that, again, because they are, to an extent, first-class protected cruisers, how much of an armoured cruiser role are they fitting into? Well, theoretically, quite heavy. But you'll notice also there is something interesting about these ships. The guns are quite high up the hull. Look at it. The guns really are high up the hull. Now, there is a reason for this. It isn't just to make them pretty. It's to keep them fine in a sea movement. It's to keep them fine in heavy seas. Now, it works well. And it does help them. But, and I say this with a lot of love and respect for it. It's not a universally saving position. It's certainly not a universally helpful position having them higher up in the hull. It does raise your metacentric height, which in a previous video, of course, I talked about the Royal Yacht and it's sinking air, well, it's rocking, not even sinking, it's rocking, and the effect that it had on Sir William White. Well, these ships are also finely balanced vessels, but they did manage to solve that problem to an extent by having a 1.6 to 3.9 inch armoured deck. Or 4 to 10 centimetre armoured deck. It does help. It does really help in terms of making sure you're keeping your weight down. Well, your metacentric height down. Not your weight down. You're still going to be heavy as anything. The ships were built to do pretty much everything. They were going to be the main thing which people outside of Germany and outside of Europe saw of Germany. When they saw the smaller ships, oh, those would be, yeah, we have all these little ships. But these were going to be the things which were going around as the regular status units. They were going to be going around going, hello, yes, you might see something bigger at some point, but mainly you're going to see us. And we're going to make sure you realise just how capable Germany is. Although, again, not fast. 18 and a half to 19 and a half knots. Well, let's be honest, fast enough for the 1890s. Fast enough for the 1890s. But, again, as I keep pointing out, this is an era of great technological change. And what's fast enough for the 1890s is not for the 1900s. But, as a rule, I would say you don't want to be the cruiser that a battleship can catch. If a battleship can catch you in a, in a race, you're in trouble as a cruiser. You are. It's just it's just a basic rule of thumb. If a battleship can catch you, you're in trouble. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you are in trouble. So, displacement. 5,660 to 5,850 tons. 85 tons. Uh, full load, 6,491 to 6,705 tons. Mm -hmm. Between 110.5 and 110.6 metres in length. So some of them were a little bit longer. 10 centimetres. It's just, it's just terrible. That's such bad construction. Across the class of five ships in the 1890s, there is 10 centimetres of a variance. It's just it's terrible. Terrible. And they should hand back their precision engineering cards. Seriously. Sorry, I couldn't resist. 6.58 meters to 7.08 meters in draft. 12 fire tube boilers supplying 10,000 indicated horsepower to three triple expansion steam engines supporting three shafts and screw propellers with top speed of 18.5 to 19.5 knots, depending on various factors. Uh, or a range of 3,412 nautical miles at 12 knots. 
Complement, 31 officers, 466, uh, 446 enlisted men. It's on the screen in front of me. I'm actually reading it rather than remembering it, or reading it from my notes, and I still <laughs> managed to get that wrong. <laughs> Life happens. Um, two 21 centimeter, 8.3 inch guns, eight 15 centimeter, 5.9 inch guns, 10 8.8 centimeter, three and a half inch guns, three 45 centimeter, 70.7 inch torpedo tubes. That's a big power. I know we see the sort of deck, turrets, casemates, and conning tower. These are a well proportioned ship. They are a very fine foray into the design world. And here is the design. Here is it for you to look at. Hmm. You have these lovely guns. The main guns, of course. The 8.3s, although for some reason on this draw I think they're listed as 8.27. It's always nice when someone lists, lists something as an 8.27 rather than 8.3. And I'm sitting there going, mm, you're not wrong, but you're not right. It's, it's all around me. As you can see, the 5.9s are spread around kind of interestingly. We've got a couple in... Well, I would personally, looking at pictures, and I say this looking at pictures, would call them turrets because they do have a full circumference of metal. But it's very thin metal, so some people do, try, do suggest they should be called mounts instead. And then you have others which are casemated in. As you can see, they are far more visible here. And if you go back to this picture, the lower gun, you can see, if you go along from the open door on the fore deck, you can see the gun is just next to that porthole. And you can see the casemate position. Now, of course, they had eight of these 15 centimeter guns. So, yes, there is one aft as well. And you can also see the positions of all the other little guns. So they have a well-designed and well-laid-out well fields of fire. Hmm, sort of. And please note, I say sort of for a reason. We're already starting to get to the period where you're starting to talk about twin guns for the turrets, especially the fore and aft turrets. And honestly, you're starting to start to think about longer range engagements. And there is something that always I always sort of think when I see ships which are designed like this in this period, you know those large guns are literally just status symbols. Because you know the real killing power is your smaller guns with the rapid uh, quick uh, with the quick firing status because they're going to be the one, you're going to be engaging at those ranges where the large guns, if they score a hit, great. And if they don't, well, you're deluging the other ship in as much of 5.9 inch fire as you physically can. It does show the transition. The fact is, those the age of those heavy guns is coming. And everyone really knows it, but they don't really know how it's going to come and what form it's going to come. So everyone's designing them with it and with that capability there. But we all know as well also that when you're looking for real long-range fire, you want the ability to be able to do... Well, you need the ability to be able to do some form of volley fire, salvo fire, in order to really accurately position your fire at long range. We also know two guns are not enough for that. And let's be honest, if you're putting in a couple of turrets, you probably need to be at least at four, because a twin and a single is going to be weird, because they're going to be at different levels, especially if it's designed like this. So you probably need at least a four, preferably six. Just the way it is with the technology at the time. So, Victoria Louise. She's a pretty looking ship. They are pretty looking ships. Now, she was constructed under the order, a contract name of L. 
She was laid down at A.G. Veza shipyard in Bremen on the 9th of April, 1896. She's launched in the presence of Frederick Augustus II, the Grand Duke of Oldenburg, who gave a speech. It's always nice when you have someone big and important there to give a speech. It sounds good. Her first commander was Captain Zassi, Hugo Westphal, who had overseen the construction of the uh, of her sea trials from her commissioning to 11th of September uh, to 11th of September. The ship was then temporarily decommissioned, placed in reserve for improvements at the Kaiserlichwacht, i.e. the Imperial Shipyard in Wilhelmshaven. She was recommissioned for additional trials in August 1900, under the command by this point of Captain Zussi, Hans Mier. These trials took place until December, and then in 20th of January 1901, she joined the squadron, which was to be commanded by Prince Heinrich. Yes, Prince Heinrich, the younger brother of Emperor Wilhelm II, the one who I say would, and I think many people agree, would have actually been a better Kaiser. There are occasions when actually the younger brother would have been the better king. There are some occasions where they think they would have been a better king and they really wouldn't have been. I think you're about to see that in some of the television programs we have going, uh, coming away shortly. They were sent to Britain, rather appropriately with Prince Heinrich, as he's another of her grandsons, to participate in the funeral of Queen Victoria. After that point, Victoria Louise was assigned to the 1st Battle Squadron on 20th April. And she remained with them till 1903. She participated in the annual training routine of the squadron, the fleet manoeuvres. She took part in everything. During the fleet manoeuvres in autumn 1902, operating alongside the Amazon and the Aviso Heller as part of First Garden Group, which was, for this exercise, the main reconnaissance unit of the German fleet. Contra Admiral, that's the rear admiral in charge, Ludwig Brockenhagen, who was the deputy commander of First Squadron, but acting as in charge of First Scouting Group, used Victoria Louise as his flagship. That's a big thing. And sensible. She's a capable ship for that role. In March 1903, she's reassigned permanently to First Scouting Group, along with the Prince Heinrich, one of the armoured cruisers. She then went for a cruise in the Atlantic, going as far as Spain, where she visited Vigo. And then she served as a stand-in for the coastal defence ship Hildebrand in during an exercise, as the Hildebrand itself was undergoing repairs. Whilst doing this, she was also operating as the flagship for Vice Admiral Ernest Fritz, who was the, technically the commander of 2nd Battle Squadron. She returned the first scouting group for the subsequent routine of manoeuvres in the Baltic and North Seas and then returned to Wilhelmshaven and was decommissioned again. As mentioned earlier, her modernisation in 1906 will turn her into a naval training ship for naval cadets and apprentice seamen, replacing, in her case, the old screw corvette Stain in the role. The Herfer. Now, she got to visit America quite a bit in her career, it seems. Or at least there are a fair number of pictures of her out there. She served with the East Asia Squadron. She served in the Boxer Uprising. And as said, she managed to visit the United States. During the Hudson Fulton Celebration. It's a nice thing to go. These ships are good ships to send for these sort of presence missions when you want to have something there. She departed for East Asia in 1899, stopping in Singapore on 21st of May and arriving at Tsingtao in Kachal Bay, concession, on the 8th of June. Her arrival allowed the ironclad, the Kaiser, to return to Germany. And the contra admiral at this point, Ernst Fritz, who was the deputy commander of East Asia Squadron, made her for his flagship. Temporarily, but 
it was a nice ship to be on. He then took her on a tour of the northern part of the station, sometimes cruising off vessels, sometimes alone, before turning south to arriving in Amoy, China on the 2nd of November. There she met Hansa, one of her sisters, which Fritz decided to choose as his new flagship. Obviously, he liked the ships, but he decided he wanted Hansa instead of Herfa. I have honestly no idea what attracted him to Hansa over Herfa, but perhaps he preferred the name. They, when they are exactly the same ship, I just... I don't see the point. There is another option. The fact that... Um, Herfa then was nicked to go and accompany the squadron flagship, the ironclad Deutschland. Went to Hong Kong. They went into dry dock for maintenance. Thank you, Britain. That lasted three months. Then, when Deutschland left for home, Vice Admiral Felix von Bandermann, the flag of the squadron commander of East Asia, transferred his flag to Herfa. So, that could have been it. It could have been that, um, well, Fritz liked the ship, but he didn't, wasn't going to get it because the uh, squadron commander said, I want Herfa. So, you can have hands up. At which point she went on a tour of Japan, where she visited the Meiji Emperor. And at this point, the squadron actually consists of Herfa, Hansa, protected cruisers Kaiserin, Augusta, and Irene, and the unprotected cruiser Gefian, our old friend from the previous series of these videos. They rendezvoused at Tsingtao on the 23rd of April for some training and working out as a group and then dispersed, as was standard, for cruises. Um, Herfer and Gefian went to visit the Yangtze River and went up as far as Hankow in mid-May. And this is May 1900. The ships, well, then they all returned again to Tsingtao. Basically, the whole thing about this the presence force and what they're doing in East Asia is they would group up together at Singtao, do some exercises, and then go out and go, Hello world, we're here! And then come back together and group up and do some exercises. And then go out and go, Hello world, we're here! And that's how they were magnifying their presence, by going in and going out. So they disappear, where do you send them off to? Well, if you send them off to another place, it looks like you're constantly going around, and it looks kind of obvious. They need to look like they're expanded over the whole area. So they come back, and then different ships go off to different areas. So you have a constant presence, but it's not continuous but it's enough so it when it so it doesn't become let's put it if it's a continuous present it can become oh yeah the germans are here mm, they always are whereas you want to be going and coming back and going and come back with different ships to show the magnificence or magnificence of your presence and the the greatness of your presence whilst also still generating those sort of mental headlines in people when you turn up ah freya I like her. She looks cute. Now, her service is a bit more interesting because after fitting out, she began building sea trials, and this revealed humongous problems with boilers. This force uh, forced the navy to actually issue not just a informal complaint or register but actually go to a formal complaint to manufacturer the Fre frederick krupp uh german or the german uh, the german shipbuilding works of um, frederick krupp they were forced to provide replacements these still didn't work so they had to turn to britain and they went to forninkraft Which then, thanks to the designs given by Fornicroft, the Reichsmarine Marinat, or the RMA, the Imperial Navy Office, and their engineers, managed to develop further, which leading to what become their sort of marine type boiler. This was sort of, they were having problems, they go and get a British boiler design, they then develop it and they turn out their own marine-style boiler based on that with their own ideas. This boiler would actually end up being used on most German warships thereafter, making her incredibly important. 
She's finally commissioned in October 1898 for additional sea trials. And she was officially assigned to the 2nd Division of 1st Battle Squadron, replacing Shanshen, an old ironclad at this point. She was not yet considered ready for active service by any stretch of the imagination. In 1899, she was lightly, uh, lightly damaged, colliding with an Ottoman Empire ship when that vessel broke free from her moorings. <coughs> and she finally gets a commanding officer, Captain Sussi, Hugo Westphal, in October 1900. She technically remains on trials until June 1901, when she's decommissioned transferred to the Artillery Testing Command and is recommissioned in May 1902 to join that establishment properly. Under the command of Fregatten Captain Herman Jacobson. This is probably due to the fact that her boilers are still causing issues, and in fact, during exercises in, I think, September that year even, maybe even August that year, um, she suffered damage to her boilers that necessitated repairs that weren't completed till a good chunk of September was over. She then returned to being a gunnery training ship, along with her tender vessel, which was the old armoured gunboat Brummer. Unfortunately, those vessels themselves managed to collide in November that year. 1903 um, managed to pass without incident, and in 1904 she's decommissioned for to be sent to Wilhelmshaven to be changed into a training ship, because the naval commanders decided to do that with all the ships. Now, what happens as a whole across the class, you can see their transition because they change from having three funnels to two when they do this. Interesting enough, Freya kept all three funnels. I'm sure it was nothing to do with the consistent engine trouble she'd consistently had. I'm sure there was another decent reason for doing this. Veneta, well, she is the specialist for the America station. Uh, she reached St. Lucia in... June, I think it's 1900, and joined the American station, which had been disbanded previously for several years, as the previous station ship, the Greer, had been transferred away in 1898. I know, they, had this, uh, they have a real vibrant America station, don't they? It's been disbanded for like three years at this point. She then goes and visits New Orleans and several ports in Mexico before returning to the Venezuelan coast, where technically the station is supposed to be based to an extent. And when I say based, I mean loosely. Considering what happens later with Venezuela, you start to realise that the yeah, base in Venezuela is a stretch. In May, she inspected Margarita Island off the coast of Venezuela for its potential as a proper naval base. But it was determined it was insufficient for the purposes. She then went to La Piata, Argentina, before returning north. It was found that it felt that it was too far away. Now, she received, well, in. She received orders in August to stop in La Gara to protect German nationals and business interests during what was the Thousand Days War between Venezuela and Colombia. And she was soon joined by the unprotected cruiser the Falk and the old corvettes the Stein and the Malt. Remember, these are ships which actually had been replaced at certain points by this class. Their purpose was to protect Germans in the area and also as a show of force to encourage the Venezuelan government to make reparations. In October, two sailors from Veneta were arrested in Caracas, and the cruiser sent a landing party ashore in Lagaria to demand their release, which was quickly granted. Amazingly enough, a load of armed people backed up by something mounting mini-guns, 
mostly 5.9 inch, but a couple of 8.27 or 8.3 inch, depending on your perspective. Uh, guns made a point. It really did. And a German merchant vessel was then fired upon off the coast of Venezuela. These incidents were largely resolved diplomatically, but they are leading to trouble. And remember, the Venezuelan crisis takes place between 1902 and 1903, so this is 1901. Veneta then goes to Newport News, the USA, for maintenance. Again, notice this. Germany is having to rely on Britain and America for their foreign stations. This is the trouble when you do foreign stations to improve your image and make you look powerful. Oh, we can deploy this and this around the world. Well, the trouble is, you don't look powerful to Britain because you have to come to us for your maintenance. So all we have to do to cripple your fleet is just go, no. And watch you collapse. And it's the same with the Americans. This gives them a confidence when dealing with the Germans. There is a difference when dealing with the Brits versus the, for the Americans at this point. And to an extent, there's a difference for the Brits dealing with the Americans at this point. As I've said before, the naval race is numbers with Germany, but it's technology with America and Italy. There is an interesting thing to think about with while Vanessa was under repair whether things would have gone as badly as they had if she was available. Because when Falkenstein are left in Ligaria, they're really not as powerful as Veneta is. And when Stein and Malk leave to go home, they're replaced by the Gazelle, which arrives in February 1902. Veneta returns to Newport News for another overhaul between May and September. And various officers actually fall ill while she's in dock. She finally emerged from dry dock in the end of September. And she steams to Port-au-Prince in Haiti. This was important because, the Germans being the Germans, the Panther had sunk a Haitian gunboat, the Crater Periol in the uh, Macamonia incident during the middle of the Civil War on Haisha earlier, and basically Veneta was there to smooth things over and try and remind people not to start a war with them. She's replaced on station by Fulk at some point, and then she returns to Venezuelan waters in time for, well, the Venezuelan crisis to erupt. And then we have Hansa. Now, Hansa made the German East Asia Squadron her home for the first six years of her career. She landed and contributed a landing force to the capture of the Taku Forts during the Boxer Uprising in 1900. In 1904, she participated in the internment of the Russian battleship Severich after the Battle of the Yellow Sea during the Russo-Japanese War. And... In 1906, of course, she's, retur uh, she's returned to, to Germany and turned into a training ship. I have to say I'm going to do the 1901 to 1906 period of her life because it's especially interesting. Now. In March of 1905, after the outbreak of the Russo-Japanese War, Hansa went to evacuate, and, well, for, uh, sort of in February, she went to evacuate German nationals from Seoul and Korea and Port Arthur and Dalian on the Laodang Peninsula. She was basically getting all the civilians out the way. In early March, she was again in Hong Kong. She was joined there by the flagship which are a pastry and roll, the First Bismarck which, of course, was Germany's first armoured cruiser. Again, they've been set out there for status. In August 1905, the Severich, a badly damaged Russian battleship and three destroyers, sought refuge in Tsingtao, following the Russian defeat in the Battle of the Yellow Sea. Germany was neutral, so what happened was the East Asia Squadron interned Severich and its destroyers. The Russians went, okay, but then in the 30th of August, they'd restocked their coal supplies from three British steamers. 
Remember, the British are supporting the Japanese, but they're also selling coal merrily to everyone at this point. To stop them leaving, Hansa and First Bismarck clear fraction. And the two cruisers were joined by Hansa's sister, Herfa, the Gear, and the gunboats Luch and Tiger. Later on, Heinrich von Moltke, the Contra Admiral at this point, times to replace the current commander of the fleet out there, Holzendorf, as deputy command. Well, Holzendorf as deputy commander. It's a Contra Admiral as the deputy commander. Uh, and though Hansa was no longer considered a flagship. He took her as such, because despite the second admiral post having been theoretically abolished, until he was replaced, he felt she was useful. On 20th of May 1906, she assisted the Nord Nord Norddeutsche Lloyd, Norddeutsche Lloyd, always have on the name, the SS Rune, which had run aground off Kuzoshima in the Philippine Sea, and after pulling her free, Hansa towed the vessel to Nagasaki. In July 1906, she received orders to return to Germany, arriving in Danzig by the 26th of October, where she's decommissioned and sent to be turned into a training ship. So, the Victoria Louises, are they worth it? Yes, they are, and they're very useful ships. But they have really a very relatively short service life of maximum utility. Five years. In five years, they go from being the bee's knees and one of the best ships out there to being something which we are relegating the training duties because this really isn't what we need for fighting a war. Or rather... It's no longer having the impression we want it to around the world. It doesn't give the world the image we want it to. Which is a harsh judgment to put on a ship which is less than five years old. But it is the case. I like this class. I consider them special and I consider them a well-designed group of ships. But I also think that... They are a product of their construction, and they're a product of their era. They needed to be, to an extent, designers and engineers who were going to future-proof them, who were going to look ahead at what the world was coming, and what the world would be. And they didn't get that. They got ships, and they got designers and engineers who built a very good ship for the period they were in. But they don't do so well after a decade. And why am I being this harsh? Because if I look at some of the other examples of protected cruisers we're looking at, they do do well for about a decade or more. Usually they are actually produced early in the period. And it might do with, be to do with the phase of technology they're in. Having a ship commissioned in and built in the last three years of the 19th century just before you turn into the 20th century, is going to be difficult. Having a ship which is still going to be fundamentally useful is a different matter. It's not going to have... You don't have the option of turbine power. You don't have the option of a lot of things. But I would say as well, they could have been built to be faster. There are American cruisers and British cruisers using triple expansion steam engines which are getting faster than 18 and a half and 19 and a half knots at this period. They have 3,412 nautical miles at 12 knots is not going to roll out to anything like a long range cruising range. And yes, they have decent protection. Yes, they have decent guns, but everything looks fine until you start comparing it to what comes next. They have no party piece which is going to give them still an edge over ships which might be built after them. They're just a solid design with no zing. But that doesn't make them a bad design. It just makes them what they were. Now speaking of that, I want to... I want they had basically, as I said, 
A practical service life before they tro converted the training ships. Yes, they're reactivated in the World War, but for practical reasons, they're pretty much their pra practical service life is five, six years. I want you to think as the question for this week, well, not this week, for this episode, which is coming out on a Saturday. The question for this video, as I always finish a question, is... Can you think of any classes which have had a shorter practical operational life? Not shorter in terms of times of actually service because they spent so much time in reserve, but shorter in terms of they've had five or six years or less. I'd be really interested to see what you all think of because there are a couple of classes wandering around in my head which are shorter, but there might well be ships within classes which I don't know about. There's always the fact that you could have a class which 99% of the members are really long serviced. However, there's one ship which only does four days because it's just such a bad engine mix. And even this class did have Freya, which was kind of the black sheep of the family. Um, to use that expression. Or rather... I wasn't going to use black sheep. What was I going to say? Ah, I now remember. I was going to say coal. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> yes. The coal smoke covered sheep of the family because that was one of her problems with her engines. The coal soot kept getting into the boilers and she kept having all sorts of issues with them clogging up. So, yes, the soot covered sheep of the family. <sighs> I mangled that joke. I do apologize. But I hope you enjoyed this video. And I hope you enjoyed all these videos. They've been a pleasure to produce. There is another half of the series coming out on my next trip in November. And of course, in I'm trying to do even more videos. It's all been in many ways practice for the masses of videos I'm going to be doing over the Christmas period. So wish me luck. I'm either going to be crying or I'm going to be very happy at the end of the Christmas period. And who knows? I might even reach 10,000 subscribers by Christmas Day. So my mum might win him a bet with my aunt. It's ongoing. The bet comes back every Christmas at the moment over the last few years. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Thank you for all your support, and hope you enjoyed. And see you tomorrow at Brewships, because we'll come out on a Saturday.